All right, so the first, uh, I'm going to tell the first three speakers, uh, we're going to start off with uh, Robbie uh, Botang uh, from University of Cape Coast, Ghana. Uh, then we'll go to uh, Ricardo Gallego Taromi, uh, and I'm not sure because I don't see where you're from on the on the sheet here, uh, and Lou Ru Hugh, who just asked a question. All right, so those are the first three speakers, so I'm going to start off with Robbie. Uh, Robbie, you can go ahead and start. If you got two things open, it's going to feedback. Yeah. Hello. And hello. Yeah. So this is Andrew. I'm presenting with Rabi. We are using the same setup, um, but we are, we are working on two different things. And so I'm going to talk about mine. And then he talks about his in the same presentation. And so a background to our presentation is that the remote sensing group in um, Lund have designed a 3D printer, a, a 3D printed fluorescence hyperspectral LiDAR. And um, their setup is based on a slim fig principle, which is able to produce a data cube of this nature, something which would give you um, data in the spectral range. And then also it, um, in terms of spectra and then also in terms of range, and um, time as well. And so in the course of March, they came to um, Cape Coast to train us for close to one month on how to go about this. So we worked on printing a setup of that nature over here. And then they helped us with the setting it up. And afterwards, um, we have been trying our hands on different experiments with it. In my case, I am studying um, different types of insects with the fluorescence slider and the expectation is that um, we'll be able to monitor uh, vectors like mosquitoes, houseflies, which are pests or which are uh, which carry parasites, and then honeybees, which are also beneficial. And because it's a fluorescent slider, um, sometimes we have to tag the insects before we can do the monitoring. This is how a setup looks like. And over here we have um, the the fluorescent slider over here, and then a system or a cage where we put the insects over there for laboratory measurements. And so light is incident into this um, box to um, interact with the samples, and then we're able to get feedback into the system again. Now, when the insects are untagged, we don't put a filter in there so that we can be able to obtain uh, elastic signals at various times for us to know, and then at various ranges. And then when the insects are tagged to as well, we are able to um, put a filter in there and observe which, um, which, which insects is there depending on the tag. For, the, for instance, this is um, within the red region, so it is one of the um, colored tags in that region. And so this is going to be helpful for us in doing uh, works of this nature. Ravi is going to talk about the ones for um, okay. meditation. Okay, um, what's up? Okay, so for my aspect, okay, so we, after employing the uh, fluorescence like that on the, uh, on the uh, vectors also used for vegetation. And for this time around, uh, we, we are trying to measure, do some remote measuring uh, on some plant species. So this one is a papaya. So uh, this time around, we have a fluorescence uh, the 405 is a 405 nanometer uh, dial that we use. So we have it hitting at the back of some part of the uh, of the leaf, and uh, we we have so here's the the light hitting at the back of the leaf, and we get some fluorescence back, uh, and we measured it. So after getting the fluorescence, we have uh, some spectra like this. So this part this time around, the red dotted red that you see, here, the, it's it's a different different. Uh, different parts of the leaves that we were trying to see how it can really differentiate some different parts of it. So we hit it, uh, we targeted a, a green part of it and also a very dried part. So let's say a healthy one or a healthy one. Yeah, and so the red one is what we had there and the, and the, the black one is for the, was for the, uh, the green one. And the, the dotted red was the one that it was having a little uh, yellowish side of it. Yeah. So apart from this one too, we are trying to see if 
this thing can also be used for range measurements. So, should in case you want to measure a, a particular plant, some different plant species and a particular distance, so we are trying to see how effective the, the system can also measure with a, a wavelength and also a, with range. So we are we are still on it. There are, there are a lot of things that we are still measuring, and we are we are hoping for a, a further a good system. So uh, other uses that we are thinking of is also doing a demonstration uh, in different. Uh, aspects of the fluorescence like and also uh, interacting with students on how effective you can use this one and also uh, doing an internal or external collaborations on uh, the fluorescence like that too okay so thank you very much okay thanks so so that was uh, those are the two talks between uh, andrew you and then robbie is that is that right Yes. Okay, great. Oh, well then you're, we're really on time. Anybody have any questions? Well, Joe, do you wanna ask anything or? There we go. Now I can okay. unmute. Um, I don't know that I have a specific question, but I, I, I mean, I'm pleased to see this. I know I know this paper. I know the instrument, and I know that uh, Bridegard's group in Sweden is collaborating globally. So this is really this is really fascinating. I would I would encourage you though in this kind of presentation to really hit the the key points, maybe with fewer details. You're you're still kind of in that scientist engineer mode of of presenting details and and you know try to excite the person who's there ready to fund you and all the information is there but but you need to pick out just the important one this is remarkable how how much i guess one question i would have is is i i'm i believe that i understand that there is uh a very low cost for this. Do you know what it would cost to reproduce one of these systems, the 3D printed systems? Yes. Um, so they, depending on the kind of um, lasers that you want to use and the detectors, that may raise the cost, but with um, close to $1,000, you could be able to get um, $100 laser and then maybe a less costly detector or something of that sort. But if you want a very expensive detector, then it may raise the cost. Apart from that, the instrumentation or the printing and other um, other things are not that costly. That's really incredible, isn't it? That's fabulous. Thank you. Okay. Well, the anyway, these. Oh, Randy, do you have a question? Um, yeah, what is the what what is your resolution and range? Uh, how far can you go? Uh, cross range and distance. How what are the range resolutions on this? Yeah, so the range resolution it, it can go um, up to a hundred meters, and so in the data cube, um, they it can go up to a hundred cube from five um, meters from the onset away from the um, the source and then. Um, 100 meters away um, to the end. Yeah. So and then is it is it scanned left? Is it scanned or how do you how do you get uh, cross range? Or is it just yeah the um, no it is not scanned. So within the range, um, you can so within the range. Um, depending on whether anything crosses in between, you can be able to tell which point it crosses that. So it is fixed, and then you look at objects that goes through. But if you scan it, then it means that um, it is going to be based on the time frame. So that if um, at so your three axes are time, frequency, and range, or time, wavelength, and range, I guess. Yeah, I think we, did we lose uh, Andrew? Okay. Oh, no, I think he is online, but uh, there might uh, be. Anyway, let, 
maybe maybe we should move on to the next speaker. Yeah, we, we got <laughs> we got uh, seven more. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Robbie and, and Andrew. That was that was really great. Uh, and uh, and everybody else, pay attention to what Joe just said.